Thank you so much for joining us for our online service. We're so glad you're able to make it. Let us open up this service in the name of the triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sin unto God our Father, imploring him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. By the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Jesus Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to the penitent the entire forgiveness of their sin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray the prayer of the day together. Almighty God, grant that we, who for our evil deeds worthily deserve to be punished, by the comfort of your grace, may mercifully be comforted through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us sing our first hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. Our first scripture lesson is taken from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, reminding us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Reading in Christ's name. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. 
for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpent from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Our New Testament lesson is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, reminding us that we are saved by grace through faith alone because of Christ Jesus, reading in Christ's name. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here ends our scripture lesson. Praise be to you, O God. Our gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of John, um, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, reading in Christ's name. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen and that his works have been carried out in God. Here ends our gospel lesson. Praise be to you, O Christ. As the children of Israel were saved by God out of the land of Egypt, God revealed his love and faithfulness through his salvation. Our text is very similar. As the children of Israel left Egypt, guided by God himself, they experienced various difficulties and they exposed the true nature of their heart and the extent in which their sin-infected nature permeated all of humanity. These difficulties exposed a hardness of heart and a lack of gratitude toward God and his salvation. God delivered Israel in a miraculous way. And when we read through the account as recorded in Exodus and also in Numbers, we see a delivered people who were oftentimes ungrateful to the Lord a people who were saved, yet they oftentimes grumbled and complained as to the how of that salvation. If we're willing to, it's very easy to see ourselves in the responses of the children of Israel. In many ways, the wilderness wandering is a glimpse into our own hearts, into our own sinful nature. One such occurrence in the wilderness wandering is our Old Testament lesson found in Numbers chapter 21. It says that the children of Israel grew impatient about the salvation that God had blessed them with and the food that he had provided for them. To reveal their sin clearly, he sent fiery serpents. And he sent those serpents to bite the children of Israel and to reveal that they too are infected with a venom that leads to death. A sin-infected nature that began in the Garden of Eden. The first serpent, Satan, infected Adam and Eve with this sinful nature. And unfortunately, most of us, most of humanity, downplayed the effect of that sinful nature. The venom of our sin-infected nature leads to spiritual death and eternal separation from the creator God of the universe. 
The children of Israel repented that day and they were given hope. Hope in the form of a promise that was to come. God instructed Moses to place a serpent on a pole in the middle of the camp. As the people looked at that pole with the serpent on it, even though they were bitten, they would be saved. This reminds us of our text and the wonderful salvation that's in Christ Jesus. This was God's way of getting the people of Israel to see and acknowledge that Satan has given them this sin-infected nature that they are all bitten with, so to speak, this venom that leads to eternal damnation. But it was also God's way of revealing to the people of Israel and to us that he would heal them and he would do so through the promise of a Messiah. As we fast forward to our text, Jesus is having a discussion with a Pharisee, a religious leader in Israel, about salvation and the promise of eternal life, a man named Nicodemus, who was very curious about Jesus and had some questions for him. But Nicodemus sought out Jesus in a covert way in the midst of, of the dead of night, and he wanted to ask him several questions. Jesus, in this conversation that's beautifully recorded and preserved by the Holy Spirit, it reminds Nicodemus of our Old Testament lesson, and it reminds us of that sin-infected nature that all of us are bitten in. Like our New Testament uh, epistle lesson reminds us that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. We are totally dependent upon God's grace and mercy. But that doesn't end there. Jesus was the remedy. Through the promise of the Messiah, one would come and destroy what Satan had infected, and he would be the remedy for that sin-infected nature. He would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the great physician. He is the remedy to our sin-infected nature, and he is the one who delivers us out of the domain of darkness and transfers us into the marvelous eternal kingdom of our Heavenly Father and gives us the inheritance and the promise of eternal life for any and all who place their trust in Christ all the days of their life. Join me as we look at John chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text and this reminder that we are born with a sin-infected nature that separates us from God and reminds us that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful gift of Jesus Christ and the salvation he provided. May we never take that for granted. And Lord, I do pray that every word that proceeds from my mouth would be from you and not from me. I pray that it's in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word, and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray this in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. And so the very first thing that we see in our text is that Jesus is the great physician. Jesus is the great physician. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So as Nicodemus and Jesus kind of continue their conversation, Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to see and be, remind him of this sinful nature that all of us are born with. We are all born dead in our trespasses and sins. And so as Jesus reminds him of this account Again, it's preserved in Numbers chapter 21, where the children of Israel grumbled and complained about God's salvation. They did so, and God reminded them of this venom of a sin-infected nature that all of us have. We must be born again. Through salvation, we are saved from the eternal consequences of that sin-infected nature. We are saved from eternally being separated from the great God who has created us. Jesus is the promised Messiah who would bring healing to any and all who would look upon him and believe. And just as there was a serpent placed onto a pole, and it reminds us that on a tree, the very first serpent, Satan, brought sin in, into the world through Adam and Eve and that great deception, so too through another man being hung on a tree, salvation would come through his life, death, and resurrection. Jesus is the great physician, the one who has delivered us out of the domain of darkness and transferred us into the, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of our heavenly father. I pray that as we look upon the cross of Christ, as we remind ourselves of the victory that Christ has won for you and for me, that we would be so grateful within our heart. And though even though we may experience difficulties like the children of Israel, we would always place our trust in Jesus and remind ourselves 
that this world is not our home and that we too are traveling on our way through this wilderness wandering onto the promised land of God's eternal kingdom. May that always inspire us and also preserve us in the one true faith. The next thing that we see in our text is that God's love is revealed through Christ Jesus. Now, this may seem like a simple thing, but I think it it causes us to continually remind ourselves of the great love that we have in Christ Jesus, loved revealed by the Father himself. Let's look at verses 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There are so many wonderful illustrations and connections to our Old Testament lesson. And as we looked at the cross of Christ, as it looks at as though he was humiliated and shamed, and, and in some ways he was, as he was beaten and mocked for our sin, as he hung on the cross of Calvary for you and for me, taking our place as a silent substitute that is prophesied in the prophet Isaiah. But Jesus, as he reminds Nicodemus and us, he reminds us of our dependency on God and how we are born separated from God. This is something that even King David knew as he wrote Psalm 51, as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. It says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You teach us wisdom in the secret heart. The wisdom and the truth that David speaks of is the acknowledgement of our sinful nature and how we need salvation and our dependency on God's mercy. However, God does not force his love, grace, and mercy on anyone. He offers it as a free gift. It's the free gift of salvation. As the pole and the serpent was set up in the middle of the camp, people, as they were bitten by these snakes, they could look upon this pole and they could be saved. Us who are born with this sin-infected nature can look upon Jesus Christ, acknowledge our sinful nature, acknowledge our own inability to save ourselves, acknowledge that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and acknowledge that Jesus has paid an incredible sacrifice for you and for me, and this free gift of salvation is offered to anyone who calls on the name of Christ for the salvation of their soul. This is God's love, because God so loved the world. But also, let's make it personal, God so loved you and me that he took our place on the cross of Calvary. I pray that if we would, be, if we would hear the voice of Jesus calling us, come all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or Jesus saying, I stand at the door and knock. Or the wonderful words found in Romans 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as the children of Israel did in our Old Testament lesson. May we bow our knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords now. Today is the day of salvation. Believe in Christ and his victory. Scripture reminds us that we will not be put to shame. The final thing that we see in our text is that God desires honesty and transparency. God desires honesty and transparency. And that's really what he's trying to get Nicodemus to see. The reality that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And there's a beauty in acknowledging that. So let's look at verses 19 through 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so there's this reality about how God's word exposes everything in the light of God's mercy and grace. The writer of Hebrews really clearly um, expounds upon this in chapter 4. He says this, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And that's really the heart of Christ here. And as God has brought in the light of the world, Jesus Christ, his one and only son, 
to provide salvation through his life, death, and resurrection, there is a reality where we are brought to a crossroads. Now, in our baptism, we are placed into a state of grace, but we, we must continue in that state of grace, continuing in the faith that was given to us in our baptism, placing our trust in Christ, because Christ reminds us in the gospel that those who endure to the end will be saved. And so there's an aspect that we must foster and nurture what has been given to us and entrusted to us through Christ Jesus, and that he would bring to completion that which he started in our heart. And that journey is talked about in Ephesians chapter 4 as we are walking toward unity and spiritual maturity as the body of Christ. We do so embracing a life of confession and repentance toward a salvation without regret. And so there's this wonderful accountability that the scriptures remind us of. And this is love. But for those who reject Christ, that those who have not continued in the faith of their baptism, for those who reject Jesus and the salvation that he provided, they stand condemned already because we are born with that sin-infected nature. And this too is love. Nicodemus needed to see this. There must be an aspect of honesty that we acknowledge that we cannot do on our own, that we are by nature sinful and helpless and unable to do anything to save ourselves. There must be an acknowledgement that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And that it is only through the promise of the Messiah that we can be healed from this sin-infected venom that all of us are infected with. Jesus talks about this freedom and this honesty that comes through a freedom. In fact, it's the type of freedom that only it comes through an honesty before our Heavenly Father. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so the truth that Jesus is referring to is what he reveals in our text because he continues later on in chapter 8 and he says this, Truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. You must be born again. In fact, if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus continues and says, But if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And so as we look upon our sin with honesty and transparency, we embrace the cross of Christ to a greater degree. We cultivate an environment of confession and repentance that grows our dependency upon God, that births humility and gratitude that we don't become like the children of Israel who grumbled and complained, that as we grow in our humility and our gratitude, even though we may experience difficulties in this life, we can respond the way that Job responded as he suffered great loss in one day. And he responded by saying, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. May that type of humility be birthed in our heart here this morning. May we continue to trust in Christ all the days of our life. May we always look to Jesus, the great physician, the one who has healed us from the consequences of our sin-infected nature, the one who has provided salvation through his life, death, and resurrection, and promises us according to God's holy word, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I pray that this would be a reality in every heart here this morning. Every person under the sound of my voice would know Jesus as Lord and Savior and Messiah, and that we would always look to him. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who willingly went to the cross for you and for me, and has provided the remedy for our sin-infected nature and the promise of eternal life. May we rest in his victory all the days of our life, and may we continue to persevere according to the one true faith. Join me as we pray. Lord, I thank you for this text and this reminder of that sin-infected nature, but also of the extravagant grace, love, and mercy revealed to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May we experience the difficulties in this life with your grace, your mercy, and your love. May we not grumble and complain as the children of Israel did, but may we always look to you. May we place our trust in you in any and every situation, and may we grow in our dependency upon you as you cultivate humility and a dependency in each one of our heart. May this be so. I pray these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, amen. <laughs> Oh
Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how oh, I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Where you Christ in me Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God Teach my soul to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you Oh God, how I need you Let us continue our time of worship together by confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us enter into a time of prayer and intercession. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together where we can sing praises to you, hear of the promises of your holy word, and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. May you continue to bring to completion that which you started in each of our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we thank you for this great nation. I pray that you would just continue to guide all those who serve our nation in government from a national, state, and local level. And if there is anyone who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray a miracle would happen and you would lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, I thank you for the church. I pray that you would continue to empower and purify your church to preach the holy gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that gives you glory. I also pray that you would lead us to be beacons in our community to help us to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ, the one who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light with and without words. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, I want to pray for those who are suffering here this morning, possibly contracting the COVID virus or maybe battling cancer or some other illness. Lord, I pray that you would be with all those who are in assisted living homes or possibly shut away. Lord, I pray that you would, I don't like that. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, I want to lift up those who are suffering here this morning, possibly those who have contracted the COVID virus. I pray that you would just continue to be with them. Lord, maybe those who are battling cancer or some other illness, Lord, I pray that you would be with them as well, that your grace, love, and mercy would surround them and protect them. May you remind us and them that you will never leave us or forsake us, that your love, grace, and mercy surrounds us wherever we go, and may we always look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith who willingly went to the cross for each one of us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, I do pray for these congregations. I pray that you would continue to knit us together in a way that only you can. And Lord, that you would lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit, that we may accomplish your word and your will in the midst of our congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We now close by praying the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. I pray that this service truly blessed you. Please receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week.